Hey Jordan, how do you deal with setbacks? You know Mitch, that's a great question because that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Alright, so now that I'm done getting my ass kicked, talking about setbacks, going to talk about some of the most common setbacks that people have, especially around fitness, nutrition, training, uh, some of the setbacks that I've had throughout my career, and also some strategies you can include to help overcome any setbacks along the way. Eight weeks, is that it? No, six and a half weeks, 45 divided by seven, 6.4, so six and a half weeks, six and a half weeks, okay, cool. Should we put that in? <laughs> Let's put that in. Okay, so we're, we're six and a half weeks into the, into the mini cut, and as of yesterday and today, I'm about eight and a half pounds down. So uh, it's actually really interesting. I'll, I'll put a screenshot up here. Mitch will put a screenshot up here, which by the way, if you don't follow Mitch, go follow Mitch. We'll put his, uh, his Instagram in the description of the video. But someone sent me a DM several days ago, basically saying like, to the effect of, I would have quit already because, because I had like an 11 day plateau, right? My weight hadn't gone down in about 11 days. I hadn't seen a new low. And they're like, if, I, if this was me, I would have quit already. And then literally the next day I had a whoosh and I lost like a pound and a half. And this is so common with people where they quit right before they're about to see huge progress. And the way that I phrase that is super important, right before they're about to see huge progress. Because the reality is odds are you're making progress, you just might not see it yet and you're quitting way too fucking early. So after 11 days of not seeing a new low, boom, I had a whoosh, see a new low, and here we are. So about eight and a half pounds down in about six and a half weeks. And I feel really good. Like it's it's very simple. It's very straightforward. I've spoken about it before. Um, I'm, ha I'm tracking my calories, but I'm not weighing and measuring, okay? And I've, I've weighed and measured in the past, so now I can just eyeball. Um, so I'm eyeballing, I have a good idea. I'm having between like 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day. Training feels good, sleep feels good. Uh, I, physically, I feel good. There is a little bit of hunger, uh, and as I get leaner, hunger has been increasing but not so much to the point where I'm starving. And this is a, an important distinction to make. When you're in a calorie deficit and you're losing weight, hunger is normal, it will happen, uh, but you shouldn't be starving. If you are starving, either you've reduced your calories too much and or you're eating like shit and not enough whole, minimally processed fresh foods. So the vast majority of my diet is just whole, minimally processed fresh foods, a lot of protein, a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, uh, beans, lentils, nuts, legumes, all of that stuff. Still hitting my fiber every day. Uh, and then I'm drinking alcohol like probably four or five nights a week, a couple of drinks, and it's very relaxed. It's, it's a very simple, easy cut. And I know a, a lot of people get mad when I say that, but you have to keep in mind, I've done this for years, like I know how to do this. I've, I've done this over and over and over again. And that actually brings up another point which I briefly want to discuss. Uh, I've had a couple people say, if this is sustainable, why do you do this every so often? Like why do you do this once a year? It's a really good and valid question. If this is sustainable weight loss, how come I do this every year? I'm gonna explain. Well, I don't think weight maintenance is staying the exact same weight forever. I think weight maintenance is having a range of about five to 10 pounds, and you can decide what that range is for you, but about a five to 10 pound range that you fluctuate within. So usually on a year to year basis, I will be, I'll do, I'll start with a mini cut and I'll lose about 10 pounds. And then for the remainder of the year, I just relax and I don't count calories. I'm not in a calorie deficit. I'll slowly, slowly gain a little bit of weight up to about that 10, the top of that 10 pound range. And then boom, I, I lower my calories again, I go into a calorie deficit. So for about eight to 10 weeks a year, I'm in a calorie deficit, very slow, very steady, very sustainable. And then the rest of the year, I enjoy and I don't worry. And so for me, this is maintenance, as opposed to what a lot of people do, which is they'll crash diet, 
and then they'll gain all the weight back and more, and they repeat that cycle, and then eventually, three, five, 10, 20 years down the road, they've gained an unbelievable amount of weight and have a terrible relationship with food. Whereas for me, the, this way, I can have a couple weeks every year, like a couple months every year where I'm in a calorie deficit, and then the rest of the year I just enjoy it and I relax and I go up to that top range. Once my pants start getting tight, I get things in control again, go back down, and it's a 10 pound range. So that's why I've been doing this consistently and it works really well for me. You don't have to do it, but that's why I'm doing it. So with that being said, let's get to the rest of the video. All right, so we're talking about setbacks now and Mitch had a good idea. He wanted me to talk about like, well, why don't we define setback? And rather than me use the dictionary definition of what a setback is, I wanna tell you a little story that might give you an idea of what a setback or maybe a perceived setback actually is. So I'll never forget this. When I was in eighth grade, I was a terrible student, awful, uh, and I would cheat all the time. I would cheat on exams and tests all the time. And I remember in eighth grade, I was sitting in, I was in Miss Georgellis's uh, eighth grade history class. And uh, if, man, if Miss Georgellis is happening to see this, hi, Miss Georgellis, I'm sorry I was such a shitty student. Um, but I'll never forget this, we were taking a test and I was not cheating on this test. I wasn't cheating, but Miss Georgellis thought I was. And so, I remember she called me up to the front of the room in the middle of the test while everyone was taking the test and she just ripped my test up. She said, you get a zero. And I was like, why? She was like, cause I saw you cheating. And I got so mad because this was the one test I wasn't cheating on. Like I cheated on everything else. This is the only one that I actually wasn't cheating on. And of course she thought I was cheating on it. So she ripped it up. I got so mad uh, because I was like, I actually studied for this one and I wasn't cheating on it. But anyway, we had a big meeting. Miss Georgellis, uh, my mom came in, uh, one of the guidance counselors, and then like the the dean of eighth grade, I don't really know what to call him. Uh, his name was Mr. Lopez. Huge dude, this guy was massive. He was the, the coach of the high school football team. Just like a gargantuan man. Really nice guy though. And he came in and we, and we sat down and I was so upset. I was really angry. Uh, and I think I was angry just because this was the first one I wasn't actually cheating on and I was accused of cheating. And Mr. Lopez, he pulled me aside and he's like, listen, when we look at your whole year in eighth grade, when you look back at this, this is barely gonna be a blip on the radar. He's like, you're probably not even gonna remember much about this when we look at your year as a whole. And in that moment, I was like, yeah, right. That doesn't make any sense. Of course, I'm gonna remember this. I'm furious. I will always remember everything about this. Now, I can't even remember every teacher's name that was in the room. I can't even remember like the, what the test was on. I can't remember so much about that situation at this point. And by the end of eighth grade, like again, it was barely a blip on my radar. In the short term, in that one moment, it was huge. It was a massive spike. It took up my entire thought process. I was having phone calls with my friends and I was so mad about it. But within a few months, it was it was nothing. It didn't even register on, in my head anymore. And now, many, many years later, like 20 years later, like I barely remember it at all. I just remember that one aspect of what Mr. Lopez told me, which is it's gonna be barely a blip on your radar. And that's what I wanna talk about in terms of setbacks because I think in the moment, it's so easy to look at any number of things as like a huge deal, a massive problem, a huge setback, you're ruining all your progress. Who knows, maybe you go out to dinner on a Friday night and you eat too much or you go on a week long vacation and you gain like 10 pounds, whatever it is. And in your mind, you're like, I ruined everything. Everything is ruined. But you take a step back a wider view, look at it from a year long, three year, five year, 10 year perspective, doesn't fucking matter. It's barely a blip on your radar. So I want you to keep that in mind when we're talking about setbacks and for you going forward, when you think you've hit a setback, is it really a setback or is it a perceived setback? And when you take that wide zoom on your life as a whole, are you really even gonna care about it at all? Will you even remember that situation in five, 10, 15 years, and odds are probably not. So with that story out of the way, I wanna go back to what we were talking about earlier in regard to the 11 day plateau where someone messaged me saying, if that was me, I would have quit. This is the perfect example of what someone perceives to be a setback 
when actually it's not a setback at all. It's completely normal. A setback, I think, by by definition would be something that shouldn't happen, something that is going to, to make your progress worse, something that's gonna set you further back than where you should be. What is the should? Like in terms of what? Like it, there's no race, there's no finish line. This is this fitness thing that we're on, if we're talking about weight loss, this is a, this is a forever journey, this is for life. Like it's not like you're you're competing to lose weight faster than someone else. This It's not a setback, this is just part of the process. And what I'm actually gonna do here is I'm gonna have Mitch, I'm gonna show you uh, a zoomed in portion of my weight loss graph, okay? If we only look at this 11 day period versus if we zoom out and we look at this over the course of the last two months. And you'll see if you zoom in on this 11 day period, you might think that this is a setback, that it's not working because you're so zoomed in on this one 11 day period. But when you zoom out, and you look at it over the last two months of progress, all of a sudden, that 11 day period doesn't look like a problem. It doesn't look that bad. It actually just looks like a regular part of the process and you can see the trend is going down. And this is the problem when you only focus on a teeny tiny portion, when you zoom in on a single day or a single meal or a single food, it's, your progress is not dictated by one food. Your progress is not dictated by one day of food. Your progress is not dictated by one week of food. Your progress is dictated by what you do over the long term. And while your actions in the short term have consequences, what really matters is your actions over the long term, over a long period of time. And if you view these short term consequences as setbacks, you're just driving home such a negative, pessimistic reality that it's not real, it's not a reality, it's fake, you made it up, and you actually give yourself justifications to quit. Because if you look at that 11 day period of a plateau, and you justify quitting, well, you're never gonna achieve your goal, you're never gonna get where you want. But if you zoom out, look at it as a whole, and you realize, oh no, it's actually normal, it's not a setback at all, this is just part of the process, now you justify continuing, you justify keep going, and it's no longer a setback. So it, the idea of things being a setback is almost like an oxymoron to me. It, it's not a setback, it's just part of the process. It's normal, it's not weird. I think almost by definition, a setback would be something that, that shouldn't be there. But these periods of stagnation, these periods of plateaus, these periods of spiking up, it's normal. It's all part of the process. So rather than looking at it as a setback, look at it as just, this is normal. This is part of the process of continuing to move forward. Same thing, I mean, if you're sitting in traffic, you're driving to work, you're sitting in traffic, you don't look at traffic as a setback. You look at traffic as a regular part of going to work or going on vacation, wherever wherever you're going, traffic is a normal part of it. You're not like, oh God, this is a setback. This is just, I'm still on the road. I'm still on the way there. I'm just gonna take a little bit longer than I would like. And if that isn't a fucking metaphor for life, I don't know what is, that's life. It takes longer than you want. So do your best to enjoy it. Do your best to understand this is the process. And I mean, listen, here's the deal. Like you can either enjoy it or not. And for me personally, I'm gonna do everything in my power to enjoy as much as I possibly can. One thing my mom would say to me as a kid, when I was you know, a young kid, she would always say, listen, my best advice for you as a kid is you're only a kid once, so you might as well enjoy it. She was so right. I mean, listen, like it's a fact, you're only a kid once but you only live once too. So even after you're a kid, like do you wanna spend the majority of your life looking at everything as a setback, like it's not working? Or do you wanna look at it as just part of the process and enjoy it to the best of your ability? Because I guarantee when you're 80, 90, 100 years old, if you're, if you're blessed enough to live that long, you're not gonna look back on when you were 20, 30, 40, 50 and be like, oh man, like I just, I wish I lost that weight faster. You'd be like, no, I wish I enjoyed that time more and that process more and I stopped being so hard on myself. So stop looking at things as setbacks and just look at it as part of the process. Put a smile on your fucking face and enjoy it. Now, moving on from there, I have another story for you. I've got tons and tons of stories, which if you like my stories and you like listening to me talk, just leave me a comment down below. I'm needy, I need to know like that I've still got your attention, you enjoy this. If you don't, if you don't enjoy this, let me know and I can do other stuff in future videos. But if you like the storytelling, uh, please let me know. It would actually help a lot so I have some better ideas of what to do. But anyway, I'm gonna tell you a story about my deadlift. 
And if you don't know, I deadlifted four times my body weight. I'm one of very, very, very few people in the world to ever do that. And I don't say this to brag, I say this just because it's a very difficult thing to do to deadlift four times your body weight. And I wanna give you a, a insight into the journey of me getting there. So I deadlifted 530 pounds, weighing 132 pounds. Uh, to my knowledge, there's less than 15 people in the world to ever deadlift four times body weight. I might be wrong on that statistic now, but uh, very few people have ever been able to do that. And it's something I'm, I'm very proud of in terms of my accomplishments in my life. Not too long before I hit this, this record, this 530 pounds, weighing 132, my previous record before that was 485 pounds. And I competed at a competition. It was an IPF, International Powerlifting Federation competition. At 132, I deadlifted 485 pounds, okay? And that was my personal record at that time. And I could, I could taste the four times body weight coming. I knew it was coming. But my ego also started to get a little inflated. I started to get a little bit of an audience and people were like, oh, you're so strong, you're so strong. And you know, my ego really started to get a little bit inflated from that. And what happened was, is because I thought I was so strong, I actually started doing things to my training program that were ill-advised. And without going into too much science in regard to the actual training, um, I started lifting too heavy on a regular basis. So I was doing a percentage-based training program that I was writing myself, and when I should have been lifting around 50 to 60% of my one rep max, I started to lift closer to 70 to 80% of one, my, my one rep max, which is a massive, massive difference and puts a tremendous amount of extra stress, not only on my body, but my central nervous system. So I deadlifted 485, and I immediately changed my program, not drastically, but just changed the percentages so I could lift more. And if I really think back to it, it was probably because I started posting on social media and I wanted people to see that I was lifting more weight. And so I changed the percentages. And so over the next 10 months after I deadlifted 485 pounds, my deadlift went from 485 to 405. It dropped from 485 to 405, it dropped almost 100 pounds over almost a year of training. Now, if you are if you like strength training and if you like lifting weights, most people who like strength training, they get frustrated if their strength doesn't go up in a week or two weeks or three weeks of strength training, never mind staying the same, never mind going down. Imagine for almost an entire year of training, an entire year of going to the gym religiously, not missing a single training day, Every single time you go to the gym, your strength is going down and down and down and down. And you don't know what's going on and you're getting pissed, but you don't quit. You keep going, you keep going to the gym. Imagine that, putting so much time, so much effort, so much energy into this. And not only is your strength not going up, it's going down for a whole fucking year. I was demoralized. And I would say like, this was a legitimate setback. This was a real year long plus setback. And it was only once I got to 405, when I reanalyzed my training, I looked at my percentages objectively and I said, I'm lifting way too heavy. So I readjusted back to what I was doing before. And then within about a year, year and a half from that point, changed my percentages, started lifting a little bit lighter, more explosively, got my deadlift up to 530 pounds. And I deadlifted 530 weighing 132 for a four times body weight deadlift. And the reason I wanted to share this story with you, especially in regard to strength training and, and exercise, is because sometimes we're so hard on ourselves, like I'm not getting strong quickly enough, I'm not improving my mile time quickly enough, I'm not able to get a chin up yet, I'm not able to get a push up yet. It's, listen, strength is not linear in the same way that weight loss is not linear. It goes like this, it fluctuates up and down. And the funny part about this is, going back to my story about Mr. Lopez, like now, about a decade, almost a decade, probably like eight years after I deadlifted four times body weight, I can look back at that entire year of training where my strength was going down, I could look at the entire year as a blip on the radar. While I was in that year, it was taking up my entire thought process, all of my emotions, all of my mental energy, all of it. But now I look back and it's like the whole year goes by in a flash, it's just a blip on the screen, blip on the radar doesn't fucking matter and I can use it as a story to help other people as well to have a little bit more perspective. So yes, that was a setback, but in the grand scheme of my life, who gives a fuck? It doesn't matter. It, it was a very helpful learning tool for me, but I think the vast majority of setbacks, even the real ones, 
they don't really matter. It's about your response to it more than the actual setback itself. And fortunately, after a, almost a year of training, I was able to get back on track, change my percentages, and continue to move forward to achieve my goal. But realistically, like what nothing would have been different if I had hit that goal a year earlier. In fact, I would have learned less by going through that setback, by going through that struggle, I've learned more that I can apply to the rest of my life. So I really, and I, I don't want this to sound hippy dippy, but it's going to. When you're going through a tough time, look at it as an opportunity. Look at it, look at it as a chance for you to get better, to improve, not only improve yourself, but the people around you, to, to give more, to be a better person, a better husband, a better wife, better daughter, better brother, better sister, whatever it is to be a better individual for yourself, for your family, for your community. Um, and I know it's not easy, but sometimes like if you're really looking at your life, like what do you want the majority of your life to be like? Do you want it to be spent being happy and optimistic or do you want it to be spent being sad and, and upset and negative and pessimistic? I mean, and realistically, you get to choose. Here's what it comes down to. When you're going through a setback, you have two choices. You can either keep going or you can quit. That is it. These are the only two options. You're going through a setback, you keep going, or you quit. You decide which one are you gonna be more proud of. Are you gonna be more proud of yourself because you kept going no matter what? Or are you gonna be more proud of yourself because you called it quits? Are you gonna keep going or are you gonna bitch and moan and whine and complain and just be like a toxic, poisonous person for yourself and everyone around you? You get to decide. For me personally, I usually like to try and go for the just keep doing it but you can decide what's best for you. And I think probably you're gonna be more proud if you just keep going and trying to figure out and work, uh, work out what's best for you along the way to push through the setback. And eventually, remember, it's not even gonna be a blip on the radar. All right, about to do some cardio. We got some sprints on the bike today. Really do not wanna be doing this at all, uh, but you gotta do what you gotta do, so let's get into it. All right, 10 minute warm up is over. On to the sprints. All right, workout's over. It's fucking brutal, I'm exhausted. Before we go on to answering the Instagram q and I just remembered every single video, give out three free memberships to the Inner Circle for one month each. If you comment on this video, you're immediately entered to win a free month. So we're gonna announce the winners from this past video. So who, uh, I can't even think straight. We're just gonna announce who won a free month in the Inner Circle. All right, let's get to it. <laughs> All right, so the three Inner Circle winners for this video are Juliana Duarte, Missy Davies and Elizabeth Hyde. Congratulations to all three of you. Make sure you email me and I will set you up with a free month in the inner circle. And for everyone else watching, if you want to be entered to win, leave a comment on any video as soon as it's published and you're entered to win a free month in the inner circle. Now, let's answer some Instagram questions. All right, so the first question that we're gonna go over I've been getting this question a lot. You'll actually see a couple of different questions related to this. A ton of people have been asking me my thoughts on what Kanye said about Jewish people. Uh, Annie07 wrote, what is the best way to fight the hate that Kanye spews? Uh, M Paz Lifts said, did you hear what stupid Kanye West said about Jews? I've been getting these all the time. And I've been debating whether or not I should make a video on it. And in my heart, I think I should, but I also wanna hear your thoughts and opinions. And if I do make a video on this, I want it to be, that's the whole video, not everything, not like a, a very busy vlog, or just that's the only topic. So if you'd like me to discuss that, maybe what he said, the multiple interviews he had as a result of it, the consequences, my thoughts on it. If you want me to go into that a little bit, leave a comment and just let me know. And if you don't want me to talk about it, leave a comment and let me know as well. I just wanna get a better feel for what people are thinking. Are they sick of hearing it? Do they wanna hear my thoughts on it? Uh, and so on and so forth. So let me know what you think. And then if you want to, I'll make another video. And if you don't, then I won't make a video about it. As for the next question, this one is very nuanced 
and uh, is very incendiary. So I'm gonna do my best to handle this as uh, diplomatically as possible and as honestly as possible, okay? So Michelle Pinto asked, what do you say to obese people who feel they are healthy and happy in their skin? Is heavy and healthy possible? It's a really wonderful question, and uh, it's been a big topic in the last few years, especially as the health at every size movement has uh, grown more and more popular and, and well known. And there's a lot to discuss, not least of which just being like, what is the definition of obese, right? And before we actually even go into obesity, I want to talk about the idea of being healthy at every size, because when most people hear this, they think about people who are very, very heavy, who have a lot of body fat, but they often forget about people who might be underweight, like severely underweight. And it is without question that if you are severely underweight, maybe struggling with anorexia, bulimia, or just under eating dramatically, that is very unhealthy and can have severe negative health consequences from being underweight. No one disputes that. But for some reason, people get really riled up when we say, if someone is severely overweight, there's real negative health consequences as a result of that. So the reality is, you can be healthy at every size, but the question is, for how long? How long can you stay healthy at that size? Not to mention, there are some sizes, whether it's too small or too large, that will inherently make it more difficult to stay healthy for a long period of time. And the reason I say you can be healthy at every size is because if we look at a snapshot in time, a very small snapshot in time, maybe someone who's severely underweight or severely overweight, maybe their blood work is okay. Maybe their overall health is okay for that moment. But what happens if they stay there for months and months and months and years and years and years? A very simple question to think about is, how many people, how many elderly people, like 80s, 90s plus, have you seen who are severely overweight? Just think about it, like how many very overweight old people have you seen? And the reality is probably none. They don't exist. Because if you stay super overweight for a very long time, the negative health consequences add up dramatically. It's not something that just one day, it just happens like after a week of being overweight. It's the health consequences of your, your arteries getting clogged, of having so many issues. Like there's no doubt that your risk of dying severely increases if you have a too high of a body fat percentage. Now, the question here is where is the line? Like what is too high of a body fat percentage? Personally, I don't like using the BMI because there are a lot of but there are issues with it. I think for general population, it actually works pretty well, but I prefer just to go based on body fat percentage as opposed to simple height and weight, which is BMI. Um, generally, if we're gonna look at the BMI, if you're not an athlete, if you're just an everyday regular person, if you're in the middle ranges, you're probably okay. But if you're on either end of the extremes, that's a real fucking problem. And I don't care what potential issues you see with the BMI, the extreme ranges are dangerous. Either way underweight or way overweight, you've got a real problem and you need to get that in check. Now, just because you're on one of these extreme ranges does not mean or justify anyone being a dick to you, including yourself. Just because you're on the extreme range does not justify you calling yourself names, being an asshole to yourself, looking down on yourself. What it means is you have data, you have a fact. This is where I am on this range. What do I do now to make my life the healthiest that I possibly can and live the longest with the highest quality? Period, end of story. There, there, there is no reason for you or anybody else to justify shaming you, guilting you, or talking poorly to you. Whether it's a spouse, family members, friends, people online, whatever, or just you, there should be no talking down to people. We should be trying to lift each other up, including yourself, lifting yourself up. But the reality is, it's very difficult to be healthy for a long period of time if you're severely underweight or if you're severely overweight. So that's really what I wanna leave you with here, is if your body fat percentage is severely too low or severely too high, you're going to suffer negative health consequences. Maybe right now you're okay. I mean, think of it like smoking. Someone can smoke a cigarette and be totally fine. No issues whatsoever. No issues at all. But what happens if they smoke cigarettes regularly for five years 
people. Now there could be a real problem. What if you have someone who smokes a cigarette once a week for five years versus someone who smokes a cigarette every single day? for five years or multiple times a day for five years. We're gonna see different health effects based on the frequency and intensity with which they're doing that. Same thing with your body fat percentage. If you have a very high body fat percentage or very low body fat percentage for too long, you will suffer negative health consequences. Now, and this might be getting too deep into the, into the weeds, but like it or not, being underweight is actually healthier than being severely overweight. And we can see this throughout many, many, many populations. It's actually much better to have too low of a body fat than too high of a body fat from a physiological perspective. That doesn't take into account psychological perspective because someone who has severe, 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 severe uh, low body fat, they might actually live longer than someone who has severe too much body fat. But what's the quality of those years? Like, are they constantly thinking about food? Do they have a disordered relationship with food? Usually they do. And this is just a completely separate topic and something I just figured I'd go into, but it's a nuanced discussion and we have to be able to have these discussions without getting pissed at someone. So I can say it is objectively unhealthy over a long period of time to have too high or too low of a body fat, but also have a lot of empathy and understand that it's not as simple or as easy, excuse me, as just eat less, move more. And there might be a lot of uh, mental and emotional trauma that you've gone through in the past that could be contributing to your weight. And that's okay. Now we just have to bring the two together and work together to find what's gonna help you achieve your healthiest body and mind. So that's my thoughts on that. I hope it's helpful. I hope this video is helpful overall. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please leave a thumbs up and leave a comment as well if you'd like to be uh, entered to win a free month in the Inner Circle, which we'll announce in the next video. But thank you, I appreciate you. Have a wonderful week. I'll talk to you soon.